Thank you, John, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you particularly to Nick for those very generous opening words. I'm not going to repeat them, but I will echo John's thanks to everybody, and of course especially to our partners Anne and Ingrida. Uh, they didn't volunteer for the task, but they've ended up as co-managing directors of Kelpie Press. <coughs> <laughs> Yesterday, Kelpie Press had the first meeting of its co-managing directors, packing books to be sent out. <laughs> and I have to say, we were faced almost with the resignation of both <laughs> co-managing directors, but we got through it, and I hope the system's now established. Western countries have an environmental crisis on their hands. In Australia, you think, oh, well, yeah, that's the Great Barrier Reef. No, it's not the Great Barrier Reef. No, you think, well, it must be the Murray-Darling Basin. No, it's not the Murray-Darling Basin. We do have a political problem, a big political problem, in the Murray-Darling Basin, to do with the over-allocation of water licences. We also do have some significant environmental impacts, but nothing on the level that the um, hyperbole in the press would lead us to believe. Well, then it must be the global warming crisis. Well, of course it isn't. The global warming crisis is quite simply the biggest scientific scam in history. So the environmental crisis is not one of actual environmental crises, it's one of the perception amongst the average citizenry, both of Australia and other Western nations, that there is this environmental crisis. And that is leading to all sorts of political, um, I can't think of the word, degradations for want of a better word. Those creating this crisis do four things. The first thing they do is they capture the language. And instead of talking about the issue that they have raised, which was a good issue to raise in the late 1970s, which is, isn't carbon dioxide a greenhouse? Well, yes, it is. Aren't we putting extra in the air? Yes, yes, we are. So mightn't that cause dangerous growth? Yes, it might. Those were very good questions to ask in the late 1970s. And <clears throat> we've now spent $100 billion and 30 years almost and thousands of scientists looking for the answer, and we know the answer. The answer is no, it's not dangerous warming. But the people who raised the question are not listening to the answer. So the first thing that the alarmists do is they control the language. And instead of talking about carbon dioxide, which was the basis of the original question, they talk about carbon. And quite astonishingly, we have people up to the Prime Minister, not just one Prime Minister, but several Prime Ministers, getting up on the bully pul pulpit and talking about carbon pollution. Now, that's not only inaccurate, it's grotesque. Firstly, because it's deliberately ambiguous, anybody that uses the word carbon in public to describe this is either scientifically ignorant yes, or yes. they have an agenda. Or both. Or both. So the control of the language, you don't talk about Melbourne's water supply in terms of hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> or do you? <laughs> you don't, and, and to talk about the carbon dioxide <coughs> possible problem in terms of carbon is simply an abuse of logic, an abuse of language, and an abuse of science. So that's the first tactic. It's capture the language. Because if we talk incessantly about carbon pollution, the public will envisage little particles of soot dancing around in the air. Uh, and that's exactly. absolutely diamonds. intentional. <laughs> it's only well-heeled members of the Melbourne aristocracy that can worry about carbon and diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing they do, having controlled the language, is they control education. And starting in the late 70s, motoring into the 80s, and accelerating into the 90s, no Australian child now receives an education in environmental matters. They receive an indoctrination and a propagandisation, and that is a severe concern. The third thing they do is they refuse to debate. And uh, I think it was Nick that referred to the attitude of, of the government scientists and CSIRO scientists. They as a point of principle, not just in Australia, but worldwide, scientists associated with the United Nations Group, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, will not appear on a public platform to discuss climate change with scientists of equal stature who are independent scientists. And you may think, well, that's, that's not a big deal. It is. For 15 years, they have been maintaining this ban. So I'm frequently invited, will I participate in the debate? Of course I will. Be there tomorrow. They cannot find a CSIRO scientist, um, Les, no not Leslie Clark, I don't think of her first name, but anyway, Ms. Clark, 
who's the, the uh, um, Megan. Uh, thank you, Megan Clark, who's the uh, Director General of CSIRO, actually wrote a letter to some, uh, a conference organizer saying that there was no CSIRO science available to talk on this topic. She'd been quoted in the paper three days before as saying CSIRO had 27 scientists allocated to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change work. So it might sound trivial, it's not trivial. It's a very destructive worldwide ban. You cannot get a balanced discussion on this in public because one side simply will not turn up. In passing, they won't turn up because they know if they do, they will lose. The fourth point that they use is relentless ad hominem criticism. And the level of language is such that you and I would blanch at it, but if you're involved in this game, and all my co-authors know this, and many of the rest of you know it, you just have to shrug your shoulders and put up with this tirade of public abuse. So there's the control of language, the control of education, the refusal to debate, and the relentless ad hom criticism. The net result, policy result, is not just undesirable, it's not just expensive, and it's not just socially regressive, acting on the poorest people in our society by increasing the fundamental costs of energy and everything else. It is actually evil. The definition of insane is out of the rational mind. It is also insane. There is no scientific substantive evidence that dangerous global warming is happening or will happen. We wrote our book to combat this evil. We hope it will prove useful to people as a field guide and a reference manual. As Nick has already suggested, we'd like to think that every journalist will have this on his desk or her desk to consult when these issues come up. Um, I think it was also Nick that mentioned he hoped every member of Parliament would be receiving a copy. I'm happy to assure you, Nick, that courtesy of the magnificent support from the IPA, that will in fact be the case. Every senator and every member of parliament will be receiving a copy. I have to say they also received a copy of my previous book. I did not get a single inquiry as a result. To everyone who's helped, thank you very much again.